The Old Testament lesson for this 11th Sunday after Pentecost is from the prophet Isaiah, the 56th chapter. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Our epistle from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the 11th chapter. <clears throat> I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus to save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Please stand. Alleluia. 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 The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He leaves the broken heart and binds up their wounds. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A woman, Jesus said, great is your faith.
May it be done for you as you desire. When Jesus offends, when the Prince of Peace proclaims words that pierce our hearts, when we are scandalized by the Word made flesh Himself, what do we do? Matthew 15 is perhaps a difficult passage for us to hear. Hard words of our Lord, at times hard silence from Jesus' lips. What do we do when Jesus says something that doesn't sit well with us? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can place Jesus' words and his actions into the larger context of what he's doing. You see, Jesus' words to the Canaanite woman here in Matthew 15, they seem cold, they seem insulting, and in a way, they sort of are. But notice what he said before that. You see, Jesus goes out of Judea, he goes into Galilee, and now he is in the, re the district rather of Tyre and Sidon a place that's bordering on the Mediterranean Sea, a place that is outside of Judea proper. It's a place filled with Gentiles. It's a place in which the Jews would have been the minority. When the woman approaches Jesus, she makes a clear confession of faith. She cries out, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And Jesus says nothing. The disciples urged him to dismiss her. She's, she's crying out after us, Jesus. Just, just send her away. Only this isn't the only time in the Gospels that the disciples, they weren't really clear on who Jesus had come to serve and to save. But then Jesus opens his mouth. And he responds, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And if you're like me, these words sting. These words hurt. They hit us right between the eyes because we know that they're just not the kind of words that Jesus is supposed to use. Jesus isn't supposed to say things like this. I mean, Jesus is the same one who, in John's gospel, he says, for God so loved, not Israel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so, where is Jesus coming from here in Matthew 15? What, is this a different Jesus? Is Jesus having a particularly bad day? Did this woman do something to offend or to upset her Lord? This isn't the kind of Jesus that usually sits well with us. And yet this is the Jesus that we have. If you read through the Gospels, it actually turns out to be sort of true that Jesus is sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There are very few examples of Jesus' ministry being pointed and directed at folks who are not Jewish. In fact, only a couple really bubble to the surface when you think just off the top of your head. I mean, there is a Roman centurion's servant that Jesus heals. Uh, you remember the, the text uh, with the, uh, the ten lepers, right? Uh, Jesus sends them back to the temple the ten lepers who cried out similarly as did the, the Canaanite woman here, Lord, have mercy on us. And he sends them to the temple to show themselves to the priests. And as they're going to the temple, remember the, the leprosy begins to, to fall off of their skin. And, and one of them turns back and he returns giving thanks to God, giving thanks to Jesus. And then St. Luke in chapter 17 adds the little detail. Now he was a Samaritan. But other than that, Jesus' ministry is focused on God's own people. Because he, you see, he had come to inform Israel that the kingdom of their God was drawing near. 
It had drawn near to them even as he himself was drawing near. Even as he himself was standing in front of him. Their own king had come at last. Now, Jesus is standing in front of a Canaanite woman. And Jesus begins to tell her that, you know, he says, I came for Israel. But perhaps this woman knows a little bit more than Jesus realizes at the time. Maybe she had Isaiah 56 in her mind when she said, Yes, Lord, have mercy on me, please. When she cried out a second time, Lord, help me. When Jesus uses those words that seem to bite even harder and he says it is not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. You notice that the woman doesn't deny it. She's not offended by Jesus' words, is she? In fact, the very first word out of her mouth is yes. Indeed. Yes, Lord. But don't you know that even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table? Now, in a similar fashion to the centurion whose servant Jesus heals, in a similar fashion to the Samaritan whose leprosy Jesus heals, here Jesus commends her faith. Woman, you have great faith. It will be done for you as you have desired. You see, it's always been about faith. It's the faith of Israel that brings them into the kingdom of God. It was never specifically about a bloodline. It's always about that which is handed down from parent to child. Namely the faith. And so here also do we find sort of slipping in through the side door, these Gentiles. These Gentiles who otherwise have no place in the kingdom of God, but they cling to faith. And that's enough. Throughout the Old Testament, we have examples of, of Gentiles, of, of non-Jews, non-Israelites being uh, grafted into the kingdom. We have Rahab who housed the uh, spies there in Jericho. We have Ruth, right? David's great-grandmother, I believe. Yeah? We have Ruth, the Moabitess. She was not of Israel. And yet God is gracious to the entire world. First to Israel, first to the people of Abraham, who have the promise of Abraham. Keep the faith of Abraham. But then they are set up like a city on a hill like a beacon, like a light that shines out into the darkness of the world and draws the rest of the world in. That's the way that it's supposed to work. Jesus' ministry here in Matthew 15 is indeed directed towards Israel because they are God's people. They are the ones who have the promise. They are the ones who have the worship, the covenants. They are the ones who have the promise of, of David and an heir sitting on the throne of David forever. It just makes sense. But the woman says, isn't there any left over for me? Now, I think this is a good time for us to rewind maybe two weeks. You know, last week we had the account from Matthew 14 of Jesus walking on the water and bidding Peter to walk out with him. You remember that? The week before, though, do you remember that lesson? Earlier in Matthew 14, Jesus is there. He's, he's out in the wilderness. He's gone out into the desert, and the crowds have sort of followed him. Jesus is trying to get away because, you know, he just learned that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. Jesus wants to go, and he wants to grieve, and he wants to mourn, and he wants to, he wants to communicate with his Father in heaven. But the people pressed in on him. Like sheep without a shepherd... They were wandering around lost and aimless. And so Jesus turns to his disciples, to his under-shepherds, and he says, y'all give him something to eat. Jesus, we've only got five loaves. We've only got two fish. There's 5,000 men and even more women, children. Jesus takes them. He 
blesses them, he breaks them, he distributes them to the disciples who then distribute them to 5,000 plus. But do you remember the, the cliffhanger? you remember the ending of that account? The disciples walked around. Each one of them had a large basket, gathered up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Because you see, in the kingdom of God, in the reign of God, when God is in charge, there's always going to be leftovers. There's always going to be more than we could ever even make use of. I had a professor in college uh, who used to say that, um, he would preface this by saying, this isn't going to make sense. Jesus died for even more sins than you will ever commit. Jesus died for all sin and even more. And I think he was on to something because that really doesn't make sense. Why did Jesus die for more sins than I would ever commit or more sins than all of us collectively would all commit or more sins than the whole world would ever commit? Because ours is a God of leftovers and not leftovers that go bad in the fridge across the street. <laughs> Ours is a God of leftovers that are, that are flowing out that, that never stop. I remember uh, a few months ago when we first started having uh, private communion uh, back here in the sanctuary, uh, one of the sermons that I preached to a handful of you uh, families that came in, um, I referenced um, another uh, man who was very influential in, uh, in my life and ministry a pastor that I had when I was in St. Louis. And he had a way of, uh, of speaking in a very visual fashion. And when he talked about Psalm 23, he talked about, he said, you know, uh, I love the part in the 23rd Psalm when it gets to, you know, the Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, right? The joy of gladness. Uh, the oil that means that you are an anointed child of God. You are an heir. You are righteous in his sight. You anoint my head with oil. And then you remember the way the King James puts it after this. It says, my cup runneth over. Don't you just love that? We lose some things when we move into more modern translations. I think it says, my cup overflows, which is, just sounds like you're making a mess. My cup runneth over. That Psalm 23 image that the Lord begins to pour blessings into our life. The same Lord who is our shepherd who leads us beside the quiet waters and, and leads us into the green, calm pastures. The same Lord who is with us in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death and there's nothing to fear as long as he is with us. He pours those blessings into our life and, you know, if, if you remember the way that things used to be, my grandma used to, she'd pour milk or apple juice into a cup and you know what she would always say? She'd say, Say when. And he'd start, she'd start pouring. And then I would say, when? And she'd just stop. But if I didn't stop, you know what she would do when she got to the top of the cup? She'd stop. It's not that way with God. Because he keeps pouring blessings into our life. Blessings that spill over. Blessings that can't even be contained by us. He keeps overflowing them such that they spill out. It looks like it's going to make a blessing mess. But instead, it blesses the whole world. And that's the love of Jesus that he gave for us on the cross. That's the love. When Jesus goes to the cross, he doesn't just die. He doesn't just lay down his life for the house of Israel, but for all of mankind. As Jesus looks down upon those who crucify him, and as I look out upon those whose sins crucified him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. And that word of forgiveness is a word that is now on our lips. You see, that's the beautiful thing about people who have been changed and people who have been filled by Jesus, is that you can't help but forgive others. You can't help but love others. We're talking in Bible class right now about the book of James, and the book of James talks about the fact that living faith, if you, if you actually have, uh, let me scratch that living, if you have faith, you will do works. You will love your neighbor. You can't have one without the other. If you don't have works, then you don't have faith. The two come hand in hand together. 
Yes, we as Lutherans, we believe, teach, and confess that we are justified by grace through faith alone. Faith is never alone. Because faith always looks for a neighbor to love. It always looks for an enemy to forgive. It always looks for God. To praise Him, to give thanks to Him in every and all circumstances. So that on the last day, well, maybe heaven will look a little bit less just like this room, but it might look a little bit more like Fayette and Lee County. It might look a little bit more like the diversity that is our great state of Texas. It might look a little bit more like the rest of the world around us. Thanks be to God that he hasn't just died and risen again for us. Thanks be to God that he has died and he has risen for the whole world. Dear friends in Christ, let's go tell them. We've got good news overflowing, good news that runneth over. And that good news, it grants us peace. Peace of God which passes all understanding. May it guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord until the day when he comes again. Amen.